Um, very excited to get going into um, the bulk of the presentation and to hear from our guests today. Um, would like to introduce, so um, again, Global, uh, global Good Open Mic uh, related to fire and smart guidelines. We will be hearing from two Global Goods today, um, both electronic medical record systems. Um, excited to welcome our speakers today. We have from OpenMRS, um, Grace Potma, uh, Director of Product, um, as well as um, Roy Munge uh, from OpenSRP. And I believe we will also be um, hearing from uh, Benjamin as well today. Um, and I will um, just briefly introduce um, Digital Square. So Digital Square is a thriving, um, thriving global goods digital marketplace um, beyond global goods, um, where supply and demand come together uh, to accelerate health equity through the development adoption scale and delivery of digital health interventions. Um, this does the initiative does this by aligning investors and government bodies around a shared digital health vision based on country needs and priorities, um, working with regional and country bodies to strengthen national health, digital health governance uh, to support digital transformation, as well as development adoption and reuse of digital uh, global goods for health. Um, and very excited to welcome both of the global goods and um, all of the speakers here today. Um, as I mentioned, both um, are in the electronic medical records space, but beyond, um, both have been really strong leaders in the, um, both in fire and smart guidelines, um, uh, adoption and learning and bringing uh, use of these standards to the global health uh, space, um, as well as really strong leaders in um, uh, working with the community for uh, broader adoption and um, uptake and I think value of these for um, use in this space. Uh, I guess some housekeeping, I will say, so this uh, webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on our wiki with the recording as long as, as well as the presentation. Um, and we will invite your comments throughout um, in the chat. Uh, please drop them in and we will um, come back to them uh, uh, when we get to the to the Q and A as well, um, and welcome our speakers. Um, I will um, do, I guess, a brief introduction. So, um, so I will introduce. So, um, Roy Munga, as I mentioned, so a fire enthusiast, um, an engineering manager at Ona, responsible for providing technical and um, people leadership in sales scoping and architecting the digital health solutions at Ona. Um, and uh, I will hand off, so, and actually let me do a brief outline. We have, um, we're going to uh, have a brief overview, SMART guidelines and FIRE 101, and then we'll hear lessons from Ona's experience as well as OpenMRS, uh, a brief on challenges and looking at next steps and Q&A. And I will hand it over to Roy. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, so uh, we to start us off, uh, we'll just uh, try to understand what uh, the SMART guidelines are and uh, a bit about uh, the FIRE standard. So uh, essentially, uh, the SMART guidelines are uh, components uh, uh, that have been provided by uh, WHO and other uh, community uh, around uh, health uh, in, in general. Um, and uh, these components are such uh, are things like uh, standards, uh, specifications, algorithms, uh, libraries, and this will help implementers of uh, digital health systems um, in um, adapting uh, and uh, um, maintaining uh, their different uh, solutions. And the main of these standards is to ensure that we maintain accuracy and increase uh, the uptake of uh, digital health solutions. Uh, so the uh, SMART actually is an acronym. Uh, S means standard-based, uh, M means machine readable, 
uh, A means adaptive, R means uh, requirement based, and T means testable. Uh, and uh, they are grouped into uh, different levels. Uh, so the initial levels are just documentation. Uh, and uh, these are provided as narratives. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, an entire book around how we would uh, uh, go about uh, in, uh, providing uh, operational guidelines around how we would go about uh, uh, implementing uh, different um, interventions. And then uh, level one, level two, uh, we have digital adaptation kits. Uh, that uh, define uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a language uh, or, um, or or a domain um, in, a, in a way that's not specific to any language or domain uh, about how we, uh, we would uh, define this. And then we go to uh, more uh, machine readable guidelines uh, and, and models. Uh, and then uh, at, at the higher levels, we have the actual um, systems and tools and platforms uh, that are computable and, and, and that will implement these uh, guidelines. So, um, yeah, so as, as an example, um, we would want to um, see why we are trying to um, uh, enforce and adapt to these guidelines. And one of the ways is to think about how traditionally we have different systems, uh, different health systems, each uh, implemented in their own proprietary and custom data models. And uh, usually when we want to link this data, when we want to um, do reporting at higher national levels, uh, share data, we will have to implement custom uh, adapters uh, to, to link these uh, different systems. And if we are to approach a modular-based uh, solution, then we will have a standardized data model uh, that would enable us to uh, have interoperability, have uh, a deterministic way of uh, how we implement and determine our solutions. And then uh, through that, then we can uh, have uh, different standards that are modular and can be reused uh, by, uh, amongst ourselves. Um, as, as is the case with open, open MRS and open SAP. Um, um, maybe Grace? Yeah, thanks, Roy. And thanks so much, everyone, for sharing in the chat your existing knowledge about SMART guidelines. That's really helpful. So like many of you who are, who are new to SMART guidelines, about a year ago, our um, open MRS community uh, entered into this smart guideline world ourselves. And one of the things that we learned was that when you think about the smart guidelines, all of this, um, you know, L1, L2, L3, L4, and so on, um, it's actually a lot like a recipe where you've got some ingredients that you need in order to get the decision support and um, standard reporting outputs that you hope for. Um, so for example, some of the ingredients in this smart recipe are things like the terms or concepts that you need. So that would be, for example, what code are you going to use to represent high, high blood pressure? What code are you going to represent, um, use to represent a woman who is pregnant? And so on. So we ended up using a tool called Open Concept Lab or OCL to help us represent those terms or concepts. Another ingredient you need are forms. And um, it's going to be great to see uh, Roy walk through how ONA handles that uh, at OpenMRS. We have our own form builder, uh, but the point is that you can use your codes for different pieces, like a woman who is pregnant, does she have high blood pressure or not, and combine that with forms. But that only kind of begins your recipe. Uh, you also need a way to write your rules in the software, both the rules for your decision support logic and the rules for your reporting indicators. And that's where something called CQL comes in. We're going to be talking a lot today about these toolings um, rather than the content, but CQL stands for Clinical Quality Language, and it's a way of helping you structure and program decision support rules. We're also going to help you understand today uh, why do we use fire plan definitions as a way to help us capture the rules in software. 
So don't worry, we'll, we'll dive into that. And then of course you need a brain, you need a brain or an engine to help you calculate those software rules. Uh, your software doesn't just magically know what to do with the rules that you type. It has to have a way of calculating uh, things that are relevant either for your population or that specific patient. So we're going to explain to you today one of the tools we've been using called the CQL Evaluator Engine. And that's really our brain in the background calculating these rules. And finally, of course, you need a way to inform your end users of the result. Uh, how does the display look? And can we go beyond a pop-up modal with things like flags or tasks, follow-up lists, etc. So this is really the recipe of how we uh, take the information coming out of groups like the WHO and then make it software compatible. Thanks so much. So when we talk about a fire plan definition, if you haven't heard of this before, or if you're feeling intimidated, don't be. It's actually a really helpful tool that fire provides when it comes to decision support. Let's explain. So FHIR calls a plan definition, and this is a bit different. Um, I actually come from a nursing background, and for us, care plan meant something. Um, but in this case, FHIR defines a plan definition as your predefined group of actions that will get triggered in particular circumstances. So you can use a FHIR plan definition to represent your uh, decision support rules or even drug order sets, protocols, et cetera. Think of it as being like a little kit of, if this is true, then do this. If that is true, then do that. It's really how you're encoding the guidelines. And then a fire care plan is what gets triggered for that individual based on uh, what is relevant for them in the plan definition. So for example, let's say for this patient, um, uh, we took the stroke plan definition or the diabetes plan definition and compared it to them. Software will help us understand, well, which parts of the plan definition are relevant for that person. Okay, if this is sounding confusing, you're not alone. Let's look at an example. Next, please. So uh, I know this looks kind of scary and like code, or if you're an engineer, you're going to say, Grace, what did you do to the code? So I've shortened this plan definition to make it easier for you guys to read. So in this case, we're looking at an example plan definition from fire that's uh, been specified with fire. This is specifically for a condition called preeclampsia, which is a very serious condition that women can get during pregnancy. And you'll see that the plan definition title is uh, ANC DT17 for preeclampsia. And this is telling, you'll see there's actually two pieces that I've included in this preeclampsia plan, and they're underlined there. There's number one, which is if the following are true, refer her urgently to a hospital. And then there's number four down there. I obviously shortened things a bit for us. Um, that is just conduct high blood pressure counseling. So not all of your patients are going to need all of this information. For example, maybe your patient does meet the criteria of having high blood pressure. And so you want the system to trigger advice to counsel her on that blood pressure. And you'll see it actually gets more detailed. For example, you can see I've bolded there, give her advice to, re to rest, but also plan to see her again in one week um, if she's eight months pregnant, because we really just want to keep an eye on that blood pressure. Um, however, she might not uh, actually need urgent referral to a hospital. So even though the plan definition specified the protocol for that one patient, maybe she only needed that one piece, and that we would call the care plan what's relevant for her. Thanks. Next. Yeah, so um, thank you, Grace. So, and uh, I think um, we can see the pattern here basically is that uh, we want um, the health worker uh, to be, or even the patient or whoever uses our, the, the particular tool uh, to be able to be provided with information that will enable them uh, make uh, decisions and provide healthcare um, in a more efficient and effective way. So uh, that being the pattern, then um, 
we come across uh, what we call uh, implementation guidelines uh, and uh, the standard that uh, we are mostly discussing today is called FIRE. Um, it's a, a standard uh, for um, health interoperability and uh, defines the data models around which we can represent uh, uh, health data. Uh, so the implementation guidelines uh, around FIRE will provide us uh, with um, uh, rules around how we solve uh, specific health uh, problems uh, and uh, provide guidance uh, around what operations and uh, what uh, uh, resources uh, we will use uh, to solve those problems. And uh, one of those um, uh, aspects around that is uh, clinical decision support, uh, which basically uh, is what we are mentioning around uh, providing the healthcare workers uh, with uh, curated uh, information uh, to help them uh, provide um, care uh, to, to patients. And uh, one of those modules within uh, FIRE uh, is a, a clinical reasoning uh, uh, specifications. And this will provide with us uh, resources, uh, operations around which uh, we can uh, represent or um, evaluate or distribute um, knowledge artifacts within um, with, with a clinical knowledge artifacts. And then uh, that uh, will help us uh, provide uh, uh, quality measures, uh, digital uh, decision rules uh, and, and, and such. And uh, part of that is also um, uh, describing uh, languages or expressions that are uh, defined within FIRE that will help us um, provide that uh, dynamism around how we uh, interpret um, the, 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 the patient's information and their conditions uh, into uh, providing uh, better healthcare. So uh, the components uh, of this are uh, provided in um, this diagram. So uh, we have, um, Expression logic. So we, uh, Grace mentioned uh, CQL. Uh, it's a very uh, powerful uh, language around how uh, we uh, represent and uh, query uh, health data, uh, specifically from uh, the fire data model. We also have FirePath, which enables us to dig deep into uh, the different uh, data that's represented. Uh, and 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 uh, output it, and um, combining that with uh, some of the resources that we've talked about, such as the plan definitions, uh, which provide uh, the blueprint or yeah the the blueprint around uh, care provision, then we we can uh, implement and represent uh, decision support rules. Um, uh, have uh, decision tables uh, encoded into uh, an actual tool that we can use uh, to uh, query uh, different uh, health information and provide uh, uh, decision support for uh, patients. And also, uh, probably uh, very importantly, also uh, provide uh, clinical uh, reporting, uh, quality clinical reporting. Uh, yeah, so I'll. I'll um, request uh, my colleague Benjamin uh, to take us through um, some of the learnings uh, that we've uh, uh, gone through as we imp implement some of these standards uh, on the OpenSRP solution. Um, thank you, Lori. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Benjamin, uh, Technical Pro Programs Manager at Wona. Um, so today I'll be talking about the learnings uh, that uh, Ona has had uh, when trying to build um, uh, tools uh, around the uh, fire standard. Uh, so we've learned a lot, but we've tried to uh, squeeze all that in uh, to six or seven slides. Um, and I think the first thing uh, that uh, uh, we learned, or the first question that we had to answer uh, was how do we make um, 
fire? How do we improve the fire adoption uh, you know, to, to the rest of the world? Uh, because the standard has been there for a while, uh, but how do we make it um, more easier to use? Um, and just building one up uh, is uh, definitely not going to improve um, that adoption, but building uh, an array of tools that work together uh, to provide uh, quality um, care uh, to the patients um, is, is the way to go. Uh, so uh, if uh, you look at the slide that you're sharing, uh, we have a couple of tools uh, that all work together um, to provide this care. So uh, we have some tools that have been built by the community, uh, the fire community at large, uh, led by teams like Google, and that's the Open Health Stack, uh, which has some um, authentication uh, pieces uh, that has um, an Android native SDK uh, that allows you to build apps uh, that are uh, fire uh, powered uh, and run on your Android devices. Uh, and we also have some tools uh, around analytics and other health information systems um, integrations. And we've also built a web app uh, that helps us manage uh, the app uh, that is used out in the field uh, to provide care. Uh, and all this uh, feeds into a fire server. Uh, and the beauty of having a standard is um, we don't have to run a specific fire server uh, for the app to, to work. Uh, we can plug in into any fire compatible server. Um, and the app, um, uh, the web app, and you know, the SDK and these all other tools uh, would work around it. Uh, so right now we do use an open source uh, uh, server, uh, that's the happy server, um, uh, but we could use any, uh, any other. So I think uh, for us to improve and to you know, foster adoption, um, we definitely need to keep creating tools that make it easier uh, for people to interact with the standard. Um, Next, uh, uh, yeah, so this, this is an example uh, of how we move from uh, the WHO uh, implementation guide um, to uh, an adaptation uh, that works, uh, you know, for a specific country. Uh, so you can see uh, the first image here uh, shows us the implementation guides that WHO provides uh, for ANC. Um, and then the um, CSV in the middle is uh, a country uh, adaptation of what the uh, ANC care looks like um, you know, in that country. And so uh, the last image is a combination of the two uh, where we've adapted um, you know, the different um, resources or the different pieces provided in the implementation guide. Uh, to create specific resources uh, for a country uh, and give them the ability um, to provide um, in C care uh, based on the standards that WHO has, um, you know, WHO has um, provided for. Um, next, um, I think the other thing that uh, we learned was um, building health applications um, is not one of the easiest things, right? Um, and we've learned this through uh, several implementations that we've done, but one that's an example that I like giving is around uh, WHO NC reference app. Uh, so this reference application um, guides different countries on how they can build uh, an application to give NC care. So that took us a bit of time uh, to build, uh, but then with the introduction and um, you know the start of using the fire standard, where all the data, most of the data points are standardized, and uh, you know how um, different things will be represented, uh, and you understand the data model. It's now very easy to build um, a configurable app, uh, and by a configurable app we mean uh, an app that you just write um, simple JSON files 
uh, feed it uh, to a fire server. Uh, the app um, pulls that and configures itself to the workflow that you've uh, built the content for. So this is an example of a configurable application um, that runs uh, the adapted uh, WHO ANC uh, implementation guides, um, but it's very configurable to uh, also run other implementation guides, um, you know, like immunization, immunization and, and all that. And the good thing is all, all these configs are um, you know, saved and um, stored in the fire server. So you don't have to have uh, multiple places uh, or multiple um, APKs to run multiple um, workflows. Uh, next. Um, and the other thing that we learned is how easy um, it would be uh, to build schedules um, when the fire, when a start, when you have a stand. Um, so earlier, you know, just building the ANC schedule uh, meant that writing, you know, a ton of code. Um, um, uh, and we all know that with, um, you know, all this code that you're writing, uh, it takes time and all these things. But right now, uh, like Chris mentioned, um, you can have a, an app where you define the ANC plan definition, which has the rules of how the schedule is going to look like. Um, and then you can execute this uh, via scheduling engines uh, that uh, you can build in your apps. So uh, OpenSRP has built a, a, a scheduling engine that uh, can just the plan definition um, and the LMP or the GA of the patient and generates a care plan uh, that's tailored for this patient. Uh, but then it just doesn't stop at the care plan. Uh, so the care plan is tied to tasks uh, and these tasks help the um, health worker to understand when to perform certain uh, things and when to follow up uh, with this um, pregnant lady uh, and at what time uh, to follow up with them. Uh, it gives them visual indicators uh, of when um, visits are due, uh, when they are overdue, uh, you know, via different color coding. Uh, so this helps them uh, provide more care. Um, uh, because now they can track the schedules faster. Uh, they can know when um, uh, these ladies are at risk uh, because you can um, also write uh, rules to um, display certain flags on the app uh, when certain risks uh, in the pregnancy uh, occur. Next. Uh, yeah, so I think the other thing that uh, we learned and are pretty much pleased with is um, the ability uh, to support the health worker uh, in clinical reason. Uh, so um, the fire standard um, has defined um, a lot of rules uh, on how to capture the data. And this is defined through the standard data capture. Um, pieces of fire, um, so SDC in short. Um, and we've, there are a couple of expressions here uh, that you can use while building your forms uh, to direct um, the health worker um, you know, to, um, to the optimal and the most effective uh, care that they can give um, their patients. Uh, so we have a couple of expressions there that help us keep or show questions, a uh, couple of expressions that help us uh, have initial answers uh, to questions, a couple of expressions that help us calculate uh, different items uh, while filling the form real time. Uh, so it's now easy to calculate GA while you're filling the form, uh, other than wait after you know, collecting the data and then trying to calculate it. So that helps you Uh, identify or make decisions uh, faster. Uh, I think this, yeah, then go ahead. This is an example of a form uh, that has some of this uh, clinical decision support. 
and it's mostly on uh, when to hide and show questions. Uh, so you can see like on the third screen here, uh, we are showing um, a risk and alcohol risk based on the answers that were given in the first two slides. Uh, and we can go ahead and um, direct um, the health worker to collect information as to why uh, alcohol, um, as to why this patient is using alcohol. Um, and that helps you um, give better uh, counseling uh, while um, while attending to this uh, to this patient. Uh, next, uh, I think uh, another place where we've found a lot of um, power, and uh, uh, we've seen um, a lot of uh, improvement uh, is around reporting. Um, so right now uh, with SQL, um, I think both Roy and Chris mentioned um, what SQL does. Uh, so with SQL, we have the ability to write queries that are reusable uh, and that target specific data points, specific uh, health data points using these uh, different health codes or um, uh, that are being collected. Uh, while you're filling up the form. And uh, from, from that, uh, SQL helps us uh, calculate um, and aggregate this data uh, to generate uh, another fire resource uh, called a measure report. Um, and this measure report is what uh, we visualize uh, on the app um, as in-app reporting, uh, but can also be used uh, to be, uh, to visualize on dashboards on, on web. So that, that gives us the ability to reuse the same data that you're using on your app and the same kind of reports on your app uh, to your dashboards, which in, in improve and increase um, the cleanliness of data and um, yeah, make uh, the data standard uh, because you're not writing different pieces of, uh, of code to um, generate the different data. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that uh, I would say is the biggest uh, learning point for us uh, is the ability to build something that's configurable um, in a way that we convert a pretty much complicated uh, piece of technology and simplify it to the point that uh, now um, the workflows are not just written by engineers, uh, you know, who need to sit down with a doctor or a health practitioner for hours um, to understand what they actually going to build. Um, now we are at a point where health practitioners um, can sit down and define the plan definitions for the workflows that they need to run uh, and just plug them into the application and they have their workflows running. Um, yeah. So. Thank you. I hand it over to Chris uh, for the open MRS lessons. Thanks so much, Benjamin. And I would like to introduce my amazing colleague, Suruchi Dungana from Nepal, who uh, is our community business analyst and has actually been doing a lot of work on our Smart Guideline Clinical Decision Support Project as part of her product management fellowship with OpenMRS. So Suruchi, over to you to introduce our first use case. Thank you, Grace. Um, next slide, please. Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to explain uh, more about our learnings and lessons in OpenMRS with our implementation of a smart guidelines for decision support. Next. Uh, so uh, we are building ability to handle smart style content, which is a which will also be a great tooling for other global goods that wants to use the smart content in their application. So our project is smart guideline implementation, implementing the ANC DAC and OpenMRS. Next. Um, I will explain the basic technical workflow in the diagram. As Grace had mentioned earlier uh, in, in the smart recipe, um, we are implementing the smart recipe uh, in OpenMRS and 
In OpenMRS, we have different kinds of forms and the form can be created and uh, forms are actually for the um, a entry of different medical records. And um, while implementing the SMART guideline in OpenMRS, O3 uh, front-end forms are used and the different uh, inputs from forms are actually the input for phi to module, which triggers the care plan in a SMART guideline and uh, plan definition ID and patient IDs are uh, taken from the form and patient information. So plan definition ID is detected from which form is sub submitted. And in fire to module, fire bundles are created, which is the input for SQL API module. SQL API module is a backend O mode uh, in open MRS. In open MRS, it's a open MRS Java module, which embeds SQL engine, SQL evaluator in itself, and evaluates the evaluates the uh, plan definition care plans and plan definitions. So it will create basically the JSON output and those JSON outputs are displayed into the OpenMRS front end um, using different modules like patient flag modules. For example, if a user or a clinician is uh, using a preeclampsia form for a patient and a preeclampsia form is submitted. So the output will be something like refer to hospital and it will be displayed in OpenMRS O3 front end. Next slide, please. This is the OpenMRS O3 front end and um, uh, it, it's like uh, different vitals and forms and different patient information are submitted uh, from here. And in in the, in between the um, SQL evaluator works and um, a different kinds of output from the SQL evaluator like flags and tags are displayed over over um, OpenMRS O3 front end in in this format. Next, so we have our uh, UI pattern library in OpenMRS just to make mess so that we can maintain the consistency. So we follow a standard rule to maintain the UI pattern. Uh, next. And uh, um, uh, the audio slides were, were mainly about the front end and in the back end what happens is uh, we, we are creating SQL API module. That module embeds the SQL evaluator which extends the OpenMRS API. Uh, next, um, and uh, we execute a different care plan. So uh, uh, for for our prototype testing, we have used a ANC preeclampsia care plan, and from where we have for which we have created different concepts in, in OCL, created forms, and run a plan definition so that we can get a decision support. Next. And in the background, we have created um, we have created a dictionary and a, a collection in OCL uh, for the for different concepts that are needed for ANC DAC implementation. Uh, ANC DAC has um, its own unique IDs, which uh, uh, which usually uh, implementers do not have. I mean, in OpenMRS, we do not already have the uh, ANC DAC IDs and we use a CL, uh, so uh, in CL we did not have the mappings at the beginning. So later, what we did is we click, created a, uh, a collection with uh, ANC tag IDs and mapped it with the CL concepts so that it will be easier for us to implement uh, those concepts in OpenMRS and it and ANC tag concepts will help us to trigger different care plans in SQL engine. Yeah, those are the lessons uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the smart um, decision support. And I would like to hand over to Grace to further um, uh, uh, explain us about the smart for uh, reporting in OpenMRS. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saruchi. That was great, and. Um, we are really hoping in OpenMRS that this decision support tooling in general, like CQL, the CQL 
brain uh, will help us have a way for OpenMRS implementations to capture and execute their decision support logic in a standard way going forward. But um, that, that continues to be a big experiment. So uh, reporting metrics. How many of you are familiar with MER indicators? Maybe raise your hand in the chat if you have ever needed to deal with MER indicators. Just looking at the participants. All right, Edwin. Well, congratulations to those of you who have emerged unscathed. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for sharing your reaction. So um, every year, and Austin and Brian, thank you. Um, every year, uh, PEPFAR uh, comes out with an updated version of these really key indicators. You can see a list of them in the middle of the screen there. And um, you can see one example of one of these indicators on the right hand side of the screen. So every year your facility needs to report back actually at regular intervals to either your, your ministry or, or, or some, some uh, aggregated reporting uh, database where you're explaining here are our current metrics. This is an example of TX cur, which just means the number of people currently on antiretroviral treatment or ARTs. So uh, the challenge, though, with, with any kind of reporting um, is that, number one, it's difficult when you're dealing with a PDF because you have to figure out, okay, how does this logic and these formulas, how do they relate to me and my system? Um, and also when these are changed, you kind of have to scramble to update the formulas in your system to match what the funder is requesting. Next slide, please. So the current project that we've just recently started working with um, through uh, our great collaboration at PATH uh, is this idea, could we actually use some of the smart ecosystem tools you've seen presented today to help us calculate MER indicators that are accurate compared to how they are currently calculated by real world implementations. What you see on your screen here is a uh, first draft of the um, uh, CQL script for TXCUR that, that currently on ART treatment. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to be working through, does this help people get their indicator results faster? Next slide, please. Um, so actually, you can see a, a little known project, but a really interesting one that uh, OCL, Open Concept Lab, was working on recently through PEPFAR, uh, through the DASH project. They created a way where you could uh, host the formulas, the value sets, the terminology, the definitions, et cetera, of these complicated indicators. So here on your screen, you can see that same TXCUR PDF now living digitally in Open Concept Lab. We're imagining that this is going to be a key part of the solution. Next slide, please. So this is a quick workflow of the solution we are currently working on. This is kind of hot off the press. Um, so the different pieces, if you remember back to that recipe slide, first you need your terms, which we store as uh, OCL codes, uh, and you need your rules stored as CQL, like we just saw on the previous slide. And this will express things like um, if the patient has a code attached to their chart that they've recently picked up their antiretrovirals, then they're probably eligible eligible to be counted in that metric. Um, but then you need to package all of that together, and that's where the Fire IG comes in. Uh, and then our brain, the CQL engine, helps to run those rules. And then the theory is, let's see if we can get that working well for a existing country EMR using their existing database, whether that's um, a local database or, or something at the country level, to more rapidly and, uh, and more clearly calculate uh, their indicators in a way that shows the provenance or what assumptions or what sub-formulas or sub-sub-sub-formula logic got baked into this report indicator. So that's new and emerging. Next slide, please. Thank you. Let's talk about some challenges. It hasn't always been smooth sailing. Would you like to go first, Roy? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's uh, Thank you. Uh, 
so I think um, some of the gaps uh, with the uh, implementation guide uh, that have been provided uh, by WHO and the community. Uh, so some of them include um, uh, the implementation guides uh, do not specifically provide clear mechanisms of how we could uh, provide inline uh, SQL scripts within the questionnaires. Um, that could be a challenge and uh, probably um, also brings up uh, an issue uh, Andrew has mentioned. Sometimes we want to utilize data that we've already collected. Uh, so, uh, but that's not currently uh, uh, provided um, in the implementation guides. Uh, another challenge will be around data extraction. So that the implementation guides, um, they provide the questionnaires, uh, they provide the, uh, the, the, the questionnaire items, uh, but they don't uh, provide how we uh, would ideally transform that uh, data collected uh, into uh, specific uh, fire data uh, data resources. So um, we are probably forced to uh, presume uh, that based on the measures and the indicators uh, requirements uh, around how uh, and which data uh, we are to uh, uh, extract to. So the data extraction process is not uh, provided. Uh, also, uh, the different uh, codes uh, that we could utilize um, to represent the desired concepts uh, that are used in the clinical reporting are, not, are also not provided. Um, so, uh, yeah, so maybe uh, it's probably an opportunity uh, to, to chip in uh, as a community and, and, and uh, uh, discuss around that. Uh, maybe, uh, Grace, you want to continue? Yeah, thank you. So um, performance, oh, sorry, if you could go back one, Jen. Um, one of the things that we're still working on, the, the CQL engine, that brain that I keep mentioning, is an open source project. And, and Suruchi explained how we've uh, modularized that so that we can continue leveraging and contributing to that open source project. Uh, but it still needs some love. It's still fairly, um, it's still kind of a teenager. And so we are uh, working together with the CQL engine uh, maintenance team um, uh, to help with different bug reports and um, performance baselining. And we're really grateful for the small community that WHO is kind of stewarding at the moment of people like us, um, like OpenMRS, like Ona and more, who are experimenting with this tooling. We meet once or twice a week online to kind of share the challenges we're coming uh, up against, including performance. Um, but usage of value sets. So we saw a couple of different things uh, in this hour about how people are mapping their current codes or terminology to the terminology that gets baked into a reference um, uh, a smart guideline uh, implementation guide. We want to show you how we have this vision that um, we're working with the Open Concept Lab team to execute. Next slide, please. So uh, you might have seen this before. This is a spreadsheet that shows the different codes. You can see there in tiny print, ANCBADE27 means symptoms of severe preeclampsia. This is one of the DAX or L2 artifacts that's published by the WHO. So um, our challenge was, well, we already have many implementations already using their own codes to represent systems of severe preeclampsia. We can't just tell them to change their codes to be ANCBADE27. So what do we do? And if you can go next. So right now, uh, Saruchi showed you a slide from Open Concept Lab showing some mappings. The reason we had to do that mapping is because the Fire IG itself demands that you have a mapping to the code that it expects. So here you can see that the Fire IG was expecting that you have something that works with the code ANCB10DE17. So how can we make this easier so that you don't really need to overthink this? Next, please. Um, 
So we ended up mapping manually as Sergi showed you. So for example, we had to figure out which CL code uh, is the same like for high blood pressure as what um, the WHO was trying to uh, encode high blood pressure as. Next. And we also found that um, ha using a fire IG list did not solve this problem. You still need to do some kind of a mapping or connection to the codes that you're already using. If you don't have any digital implementation already, great, you can go ahead and use those codes, but that wasn't the case for most of us. So now you can see in the background Open Concept Lab, and you'll notice that we've circled dizziness. Uh, I think it got moved down, but it's fine. So you can see the first code at the bottom there in the bottom yellow circle, dizziness, matches to the dizziness concept there uh, in the WHO spreadsheet. Next, please. So how can we make this faster? So currently the op Open Concept Lab team is working on something that we, we jokingly call Tinder for terms, where we're trying to help with automated uh, mapping suggestions. So you could imagine uh, adding your version of OpenMRS or whatever system you're using um, and the codes that you're currently using to check for matches with, for example, the WHO codes. Next, please. And then after checking for matches, here you can see the 400 possible matches found. And then someone would go through and say, oh yeah, these two concepts for hepatitis B, they actually do look the same. Yes, I would like to map them as same as. And that just saves you the manual work of having to go out and find a matching concept for everything. So stay tuned for more from Open Concept Lab. So next steps. Uh, number one is to make mapping easier. Number two is to better support that rule engine or brain tooling ecosystem. As we mentioned, it's, uh, it needs TLC like any piece of technology that's growing into our industry. And smart IGs. Roy, did you want to mention about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Grace. So um, I think one of our key learnings uh, from all this is the fact that uh, these guidelines are only as effective as uh, the tools and platforms that are available to encode them. Yeah. So um, you find out that bigger um, percentage of what we are calling challenges is the fact that uh, the tools uh, that we're utilizing uh, to, 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 to provide uh, these uh, guidelines and these specifications uh, probably do not meet one or two uh, requirements of the of the specifications. Uh, so um, the more we invest our time, uh, the more we collaborate, the, the more we work together, and the more we build a community around this, uh, will enable us uh, make these tools more effective, uh, strengthen them, uh, make them cover more and more use cases, and uh, probably more importantly, uh, make us uh, have the, um, uh, case, case, cases uh, that we can use to go back and reevaluate the implementation guides and provide feedback to WHO and the communities that are helping uh, implement these guidelines so that we can uh, make the guidelines uh, adaptable to the different use cases that we are uh, coming across when we implement these solutions uh, in our local uh, settings. Yeah, thanks. Thank you all so much for these presentations. Um, as everyone can see, there's a wealth of, of knowledge and learnings um, that um, really do also appreciate the, the sharing from these groups. And I think looking at um, you know what opportunities there are um, both to, to move forward in this, but also you know, just how we can share our learnings um, beyond um, these sessions and some of the other um, tools available. I do want, so we have had um, a couple of questions in the chat, um, which are very welcome. I don't know, um, just in terms of, um, so for one of the first ones was around, you know, the loss of, um, with moving from, from paper to digital, some of the, the loss in the care settings. Um, I don't know on the, you know, on the implement, side of things, um, I think some of that actually is excellent for also with um, some of the implementation science research um, that WHO has uh, been conducting um, 
currently. Um, I welcome if there are any um, responses there from attendees um, uh, or for the presenters. Um, and maybe I'll pause there if uh, uh, Grace or others want to respond, or we can save that for an upcoming um, discussion. I know actually we're at two minutes, so I think we'll have an upcoming discussion regardless. Um, so I will actually um, just in only having a couple of minutes I've noted um, and thank you for all of the resources in the chat. Um, maybe I will just give um, the speakers from I guess each organization if there are any kind of final thoughts that you want to um, put out there with uh, those on the call or things that you think you are, are needed in the last two minutes here. So maybe Grace, anything you want to? Sure. Um, the big need is to talk to folks who are actively trying to use the smart content in their practice. And it sounds like a number of you uh, in the chat here are, which is awesome. We would love to talk to you. Um, we're actually also always looking for test users to help us with user research interviews for the new designs that we're working on um, to try and make sure that the way that we show the user uh, support messages is not uh, intrusive. So please do reach out to us. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Grace. And any closing, um, closing thoughts, uh, Benjamin or Roy? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, Ben, go. Okay, thanks, Roy. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, from us, um, just like uh, Roy has highlighted, um, the more we collaborate, um, the better uh, platforms we build, um, the easier it becomes to uh, use IGs, um, you know, in the different uh, settings. Uh, so just like Chris would also love to, to collaborate. So feel free to reach out to any of the owner team members um, or reach out through the different uh, fire related uh, collaboration tools uh, would, would be very much uh, interested uh, in collaborating and uh, having a chat uh, on how to, to build. Uh, the tools and the platforms uh, around uh, the smart ages. Wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for joining and for our wonderful speakers. Um, also on the Digital Square side, quite open to um, inputs on you know, uh, topics or what you're interested to hear more about or other learning opportunities um, that you are interested in. Thank you all for joining. Like I said, these materials will be posted um, on the website, and I hope that everyone has a good rest of your days. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, all. Thanks.